slides anyway. So all I'm, and the slides are just text, there's no images on them. So all I'm gonna do is, for each slide, I'm just gonna read out what's on the slide and then elaborate on the slide as I would do if they were displaying anyway. Is that okay with you, with everyone? Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, I'll introduce myself. So my name's Leah. I'm the founder of the LibreFruit project, which is what I'm coming here to talk about today. Uh, is this is this streaming starting, by the way? Is it time for me to talk yet? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'm Leah. I'm the founder of the LibreFruit project, which I'm here to talk about today. Uh, so if you're not familiar with LibreFruits, LibreFruits is a free BIOS replacement for x86 and ARM. Those are the architectures that we currently support. I say BIOS replacement, but that term is misleading because we don't actually provide BIOS services. I'll talk about that later on in the talk. So more generally, uh, generally speaking, LibreBoot is free boot firmware. Uh, I'm actually going to look at the slides myself, even though you can't see them. So, you know, what is LibreBoot? I've already explained it. You know, it's free boot firmware. Most people, when they think about free software, they're thinking about their operating system and the applications that run on it. The vast majority of people do not generally think about the boot firmware. The boot firmware is the low-level software that initializes the hardware and then basically boots your operating system. On most systems, the boot firmware is proprietary software, which means you can't study it, you can't look at the source code, you can't you know, make changes to it. You don't really have any freedom over that aspect. I'm going to talk about some of the problems with this in later slides. So LibreBoots has been around for a number of years now. Uh, since December 2013, that's when the project started. The goals are, we want to everyone to use free software exclusively. We want that to be an option. We think proprietary software shouldn't exist. We want to support as much hardware as possible. LibreBoot currently only supports a handful of laptops, desktops, and servers. We want to change that. We also want LibreBoot to be pre-installed by manufacturers. I, I'm going through, th uh, I, I said at the start of this talk, because I don't have the slides displaying on the screen, that I was going to verbally say what's on the slides, but I don't really need to for this one. So yeah, we want LibreBoot to be pre-installed by manufacturers. You know, So when you go to buy a PC from some random store, it will have free boot firmware on it. And we also want it to be easy to use for non-technical users. I'll go into more detail about this in a later slide. So the next slide says, what is the title of the next slide is, what is the problem with non-free BIOS or UFI firmware? And the bullet points are, bullet point one, no freedom for users. The four freedoms as defined by the FSF are missing. Uh, tyrant devices, some firmware prevents other operating systems. So you know, you see this more commonly on games, consoles, mobile devices, but increasingly PCs as well. On a lot of newer systems, the next bullet point, on a lot of newer systems, you sometimes find that other boot firmware is prevented as well, because the boot firmware is cryptographically signed, which means the system is actually checking the signature of your boot firmware at boot time. I'll talk about this later in a later slide as well. Uh, backdoors are common in a lot of modern boot firmware on most newer systems today. Uh, you, for instance, you can implement rootkits in, you can implement rootkits in system management mode. There's also the Intel Management Engine and AMD Platform Security Processor, which I'll talk on about in a later slide. Now, regarding bugs, obviously all software has bugs, but if it's free software, you can fix those bugs. If it's not free software, then you can't. So that's another problem with proprietary BIOS or UFI firmware. Yeah, so the problems with proprietary boot firmware is the same as any proprietary software. You can't study the software, you can't change it, you can't you know, distribute it freely. You have no freedom over how you use your technology. Someone else has power over you, usually the hardware manufacturer in this case. I'm going, now I'm on the next slides, which talks about the history of Libre Root projects. I alluded to this a few minutes ago. So the first bullet point says it was started in December 2013. I already mentioned that. So I'll give some backstory about how the LibreBoot project actually started. Originally, I was working with CoreBoot. I wasn't intending to actually start a project like LibreBoot. I was selling a laptop, the ThinkPad X60, with CoreBoot pre-installed. Uh, 
and it also had the FSF endorsed Triscal GNU plus Linux distribution pre installed. Long story short, basically, the way the LibreBoot project started was the FSF actually noticed that what I was doing. Someone notified the FSF of what I was doing. They had been running a campaign since, I believe, 2005, calling for the establishment of a fully free BIOS replacement project. The Corbett project existed at the time, but they had problems. For instance, Corbett was inserting non-free microcode updates, and generally speaking, the Corbett project was not a uh, perfect fit. I'll talk about this later on. There's a slide later on that talks about some of the problems with Corbett, which is what led to the foundation of LibreBoots. So the FSF runs a campaign called Respect Your Freedom. It's a certification program where basically they analyze products and from various companies, you know, computers, phones, any kind of, of technology, to see whether, tho whether those devices come with free software, you know, do they respect the freedom of users, did they have any known security issues like backdoors and so on. And if these devices meet the FSF standards, then those devices are endorsed by the FSF, promoted, in fact. So the LibreBoot project started from this. They wanted to promote my company. So I worked on providing a fully free version of Coreboot. I'll elaborate more on this in later slides, but basically Coreboot is not exclusively free software, although it is mostly free, still free software. So initially, we only supported one laptop, which was the ThinkPad X60 in LibreBoot. We later expanded to support many, laps, many other laptops, desktops, and servers. So regarding leadership structure, again, I'm still talking about the history of the LibreBoot projects. Initially, when the projects were much smaller, most management decisions were made by myself. I was doing most of the development. For the last two years or so now, I haven't been very active in terms of development in the LibreBoot projects. There's another individual, Andrew Robbins, or Ans underscore who on IRC, who has been doing most of the work for the last two years. The project nowadays is run by a committee, not by myself. I'll talk about this later on in a future slides. The LibreBoot, I'm, I'm on the next slide. It's really difficult to do this talk because I don't have slides. You know, I don't have slides on the display yeah. Okay, so for a brief period, LibreBoot was actually part of the GNU project. I won't go into the exact details of how that went down. Basically, long story short, we were only members of the GNU project for about four months. We have the same goals and philosophy as the GNU projects. Spiritually speaking, we are compatible. LibreBoot has applied to rejoin GNU as of last year. We haven't received a response yet. We're still waiting for that. At the moment, our priority is a new release. So I personally am not pushing for that at the moment. But after the next release, we want to basically contact the FSF again and see how that's going. So uh, the next slide is about how Libre is funded. Currently, we don't have any legal inf infrastructure for accepting donations. This is one of the benefits of either joining the GNU projects or the Software Freedom Conservancy or similar. We have discussed extensively in the LibreBoot IRC channel in the past, and we meaning I and the other developers. The problem with accepting donations is that we would need legal infrastructure, i.e. a non-profit organization. And the question arises, who controls those resources? Is there a possibility for corruption? You know, in we have to remain impartial at all times in how such funding is used. And for LibreBoot being such a small project, I, and, and this is a conclusion others in the projects came to as well, we shouldn't really focus on that because one, there's a chance that we wouldn't do it properly, and two, the project is already strained on resources uh, as it is. So we need someone else to help us provide those services. So that's one of the reasons why we're looking to join the GNU projects because that would provide infrastructure, legal infrastructure for accepting donations. So at the moment, the way the LibreBoot project is funded is I run a company called Minifree, uh, minifree.org. I sell systems with LibreBoot pre-installed. For some developments, the individual may provide their own funding as well. So 
generally speaking, whenever development is done on LibreBoot, it's done on a volunteer basis with that developer contributing their own time and resources. So when I'm working on the project, you know, I, I pay for all of my own development myself. We do want to accept donations in the future, but currently we don't. So I'm on to the next slide now, the component, some of going into some of the components of LibreBoot in abstract. So I have to explain briefly what LibreBoot actually is. I'm going to talk about Coreboot, which is the project that LibreBoot is based on in the slides soon. Basically, LibreBoot is not a fork of Coreboot. Coreboot is the name of the project that we're based on. Coreboot provides hardware initialization. We're based on Coreboot, but we don't fork Coreboot. What LibreBoot does is it attempts to provide an automated build system around Coreboot. So it takes Coreboot and the various dependencies with that and integrates everything together automatically in a way that's easy to use for non-technical users. So you can think of LibreBoot kind of like a GNU plus Linux distribution, but for your boot firmware instead. So it's a core boot uh, firmware distribution. I'll talk about this as well. We focus a lot on providing user-focused documentation. Core boots, the projects that we're based on, is more or less aimed at technical people, you know, de developers. But it's not so much designed for non-technical users. The documentation for actually using core boot is sometimes lacking. We provide some of our own utilities as well. I'll go into next, the next slide goes into more detail on some of the components of LibreBoot. So the main component is Coreboot, as I said. Coreboot provides hardware, in hardware initialization, and that's the projects that we're based on. Now, Coreboot doesn't provide a BIOS. I said that LibreBoot is a BIOS replacement earlier. LibreBoot, like Coreboot, only provides the basic hardware initialization to get your system running, but then it jumps to another program that's called a payload. Now, this payload could be a BIOS. We have a payload called CBIOS in LibreBoot, but it could also be a bootloader. So we have three payloads in LibreBoot, Grub, Depth Charge, and CBIOS. So when you start a LibreBoot system, you'll have one of these as your software actually embedded into the firmware. We provide several utilities as well. So we provide Flash ROM, which is the utility used for flashing and installing core boots or lever boots. Uh, we provide uh, other utilities as well. So for instance, on uh, Intel GM45 laptops, we provide a utility to generate the boot descriptor, which is like, uh, I, I, I'm, I might talk about that later on in, in the slides. Uh, my priority for this talk is to get through the slides as quickly as possible and then because at the end of this talk, there's going to be a list of changes that have gone on in the project in the last two years. And I also want to focus at the end on questions. So I'd like to have at least half an hour for that. So I'm just skimming through these at the moment. We also have uh, utilities from Coreboot itself. So Coreboot provides its own GCC tool chain, for instance. I'm going on to the next slide now. So I'll go into some brief history about the Coreboot projects and the nature of the projects. So as I said, Coreboot provides hardware initialization on various systems, laptops, desktops, and servers. It started in, t in the year 1999 as a project called Linux BIOS. So the idea back then was, around the, the year 1999, year 2000, hardware started to become self-describing. In the old days, you had a BIOS in place, which provided an abstraction layer, so to speak, for your operating system to make calls into to perform various hardware functions. However, in the late 90s, there were standards like PCI that came out, which meant that hardware was self-describing. You didn't need the BIOS anymore. The BIOS was basically redundant. The idea with Core Boot as Linux BIOS, as it started, was literally to provide a Linux kernel in the boot flash. So as part of the firmware, replacing all of the functions that the BIOS would have typically handled. However, over the years, people started using other payloads besides the Linux kernel. In around the year 2003, 2004, it renamed the Core Boot and became the project that it is today. Core Boot has several different payloads, uh, bootloaders. It, even it has CBIOS, which it provides BIOS services. It has uh, Tiana Core, which provides UFI. It has various different payloads that you can use. I'll talk about this later on as well. So the next slides, which I've just gone to, says, what is the problem with Core Boot? So LibreBoot is a free software project. We want everyone to use free software exclusively. Core Boot, the project that we're based on, is not exclusively free software. 
Some of the parts of Core Boots are proprietary software, i.e. binary blobs. Most newer systems nowadays in Core Boots are not exclusively free when you flash Core Boots. I'll give some examples of blobs in uh, you know, binary blobs in the later slides after this one. So that's the one of the problems with Core Boots. It's not exclusively free software. The second problem with Core Boots is that it's very difficult to install for a lot of people. The wiki or documentation for Core Boots is often extremely lacking for non-technical users. It's not clear how to compile Core Boots. It's not clear how to install Core Boots. A lot of people don't even attempt to install Core Boots just because of how intimidating it is. Core Boots as a community is focused mostly on developers, not users. This is one of the problems that Libreboot attempted has attempted to solve since its foundation. We provide a bridge between Core Boots and the non-technical community for people to use as opposed to develop the firmware. So obviously with Core Boots, if it's difficult to build for most people, <coughs> if the documentation is unclear, a lot of people who try to install Core Boots actually make mistakes and, uh, and end up bricking their system. Bricking means basically you flash, <coughs> you flash the firmware and it doesn't boot. So that's a problem with Core Boots as well. I'm on to the next slide now. So Libreboots is not a fork of Core Boots, as I mentioned before. We provide, so it says on this slide, comparison, ISO images for your favorite GNU plus a Linux operating system. Yeah, so you can think, as I said before, you can think of Libreboots like a GNU plus Linux distribution, but not for your operating system, but for the boot firmware instead. So what do I mean by that? Well. If you download any GNU plus Linux distribution, like say Triscal, GNU Sense, Parabola, you get a uh, ISO image, you flash that onto a USB drive, or I don't know, in the old days you would have used a CD-ROM or something. You put that in your system, boot up, and it comes with a nice installation interface. Everything's easy, it's all documented. You know, there might be a community holding your hand as well. If you ever need help, you can go somewhere for support. Libreboots is exactly the same thing as that, but for the boot firmware. So we provide the ROM images that you actually flash pre-built. Coreboot doesn't do that. We provide documentation that's aimed exclusively at non-technical users. We do have technical documentation as well, but our focus is on the general community. We also want to provide good documentation and good support. The problem with, co with Coreboots and a lot of projects like Coreboots is that if you go to their RLC channel or mailing lists, again, as the project is focused mostly on developers, users are often intimidated when they go to the support channels. They might not get the support they need. They might feel that, you know, they're a bit elitist in a sense. So we provide, we, in the Libreboot IRC channels and any other discussion mediums provided by the project, we try to be as friendly as possible and cater to users. That's the focus of the project. We want more people to use free software. And in, in order to do that, you actually have to make that software accessible. So that's the focus of the Libreboot project. The next slide is about deblobbing Core Boot. So I mentioned that Core Boot is not exclusively free software. A binary blob, or blob for short, is a piece of you know, compiled code. It's an executable without source code. Core Boot, for most systems nowadays, relies on blobs partially or sometimes entirely. We maintain a uh, utility in Libreboots called Coreboot Libra. It's a fork of another project called Linux Libra. Linux Libra, uh, the, li the Linux kernel, by the way, has the same problems. A lot of firmware in the Linux kernel for devices is non-free. Wi-Fi chipsets, graphics cards, you know, microcode, things like that. So there's a project uh, that's actually part of the GNU, uh, GNU project as well, called Linux Libra, which provides, what Linux Libra does is it provides a set of dblob scripts that scans the Linux source code and looks for patterns in the source code that look like binary blobs. Sometimes in the Linux kernel, you get a C source file, but it's not actually source code. You look in there and it's an array of bytes, you know, it's numbers, and they're executables. Linux Libra dblobs that provides a fully clean version of the Linux kernel and then they provide releases based on that. One consequence of that is that Linux Libre has less hardware supports than the upstream Linux kernel. Well, we do exactly the same thing in Libreboots, but for the Coreboot project. So we deblob Coreboots. So the version of, of Linux Libre that we forked is called 
Coreboot Libra. It does exactly the same thing, but for the Coreboot project. So obviously, again, as with the Linux kernel, not having as much hardware support, Libreboot doesn't have as much hardware support as Coreboot when we do this, because obviously some systems re rely on blobs nowadays. Our intention was never to fork Coreboot. The reason that Libreboot is maintained at least this was my reason when I started the project. This is also the reason of developers on the project nowadays. We don't want to cause any splits within the, co within the Corbett projects. We want the Corbett projects to be stable. So the reason Libreboot is maintained as a distribution of Corbett as such, instead of a, an actual fork, is precisely for this reason. We don't want to maintain our own free fork of Corbett. We simply provide build scripts around Corbett with deblobbing scripts as well. In that way, core boots remains core boots. And then there's a section in the core boot community of people who are focused on freedom. That's my prefer preferred way to do things. And that's still the way things are done in the Libreboot projects nowadays. The next slide is about, I'm on to the next slide now. The next slide is about another project similar to Libreboot's called LibreCore. This is not part of, uh, I'm only going to skim through this because this project is actually now defunct. The, there's no recent development on this, so this is basically a dead project at this point. It's not part of the LibreGroup project, it's its, own, it's its own separate project. LibreCore started in December 2016. Uh, basically, the backstory for that is a bunch of Corebook developers were unhappy with the current state of affairs in the Corebook project. Corebook had started to become influenced by Intel, AMD and others a lot of developers within the Corbett project were not focused on freedom anymore. So they were accepting binary blobs more casually, much like as is happening in the Linux kernel. A bunch of Corbett developers were unhappy with that, and they basically wanted to make their own project. So that, that's where LibreCore started. Unlike LibreBoot, LibreCore provides a fully deblobbed tree of Corbett. And they, like LibreBoot, they try to provide as much hardware support as possible with that. Now, this is more efficient than LibreBoot, than maintaining the blob scripts, because then it's less work, basically, and it's much easier to manage. But as I said, we don't want splits within the Corbett project. Unfortunately, uh, we were looking into using LibreCore as an upstream instead of Corbett in the LibreBoot project. Unfortunately, LibreCore has not had much development in the last year or so. The website, as far as I know, is not currently even online. In, so I'm going to go on to the next slides now. So in the next few slides, <coughs> I want to give some examples about exactly what types of binary blobs are used in, on most modern core boot systems. <coughs> so the main one is actually the entire hardware initialization. Core boot nowadays is a project that many of us in the LibreBoot project refer to as shim boot, and I'll explain what this means. So in the old days, core boots was source code. You know, the developers reverse engineered the hardware and they actually re released ports for various boards that you could actually compile and look at and study. Nowadays, Intel and AMD actually provide support to the core boot projects. They actually port hardware to core boot. However, the codes that, that they provide to the core boot project is binary blobs. They don't provide source code. So what the core boot project has done in response to this is they provide a shim around that where they use the binary blobs within the project and what Corbett basically is on a lot of newer systems is the, the you know basically the code that loads the, the payloads, you know, like CBIOS or Grub, that's free software, but the hardware initialization is entirely binary blobs. So that may seem harsh, but that's literally the case on most modern x86 systems at least. AMD was briefly providing source code. Between the year 2011 to 2014, AMD, through a company called Sage Engineering, which no longer exists, was releasing source codes for their hardware. Unfortunately, they stopped. Obviously, the problem with this is that it could be malicious. You don't know what that code is doing. Another blob that's typically used on most systems is the video BIOS. So the video BIOS provides hard initialization for the graphics chipsets. During the early boot process, before your operating system starts, it provides an interface for your video drivers to use, and it you know, basically initializes the display 
On most Corbett systems, what you have to do is extract the video BIOS from the original firmware or from your graphics card, whatever it is, and embed that into Corbett. So the firmware for initializing your graphics card is often non-free on most Corbett setups. In so this is the this blob is usually provided by the manufacturer. So in Leverboots, we have our own free replacement for this. We don't actually provide a video BIOS. We provide basic card initialization for the for the, the graphics cards, and then the Linux kernel can use that. We support that on all of the systems that, that we currently have in Leverboots. CBIOS, which I'll go on to in a, in a later slide, attempts to provide some BIOS services as well for legacy operating systems to use. And that can provide a video BIOS interface around core boot graphics initialization. Yeah, so that's one of the blobs. Another major problem with most Intel systems is a piece of software called the Intel Management Engine. This has been present on all Intel systems past the year 2006, 2007, and or something like that. What the Intel Management Engine does is it provides, uh, or the Intel Management Engine is actually its own computer inside the system. It's its own embedded system. It has its own access to memory, it has networking, and so on, and, and it provides various applications. So one of the most common one uh, applications that the Intel Management Engine provides is AMT, Active Management Technology, which provides remote access features. On some newer Intel systems, there's an extension for the Intel Management Engine called the Intel Boot Guard, which prevents hardware from, which prevents free boot firmware from being loaded because the cryptographic signature is checked at boot time for your firmware. It's commonly believed that the Intel Management Engine is a backdoor, and this is present on all modern Intel systems. Y on some systems that LibreBoot supports, there is the Intel Management Engine, but we remove it. You can read more about the Intel Management Engine on the LibreBoot FAQ, libreboot.org slash FAQ. I should also mention that AMD has something similar to the Intel Management Engine, although not quite exactly the same, called the AMD Platform Security Processor. I already mentioned that AMD is just as bad as Intel as well. They only provide binary blobs to the core boot project. Most AMD systems have more or less the same freedom and security issues as most modern Intel systems from the perspective of the Libre Root project. So those are the common examples of binary blobs. I'm going to move on now to a project called the, um, called the Talos workstation by a company called Raptor Engineering. So I mentioned earlier in the talk that one of our goals in the LibreBoot project is to have LibreBoot pre-installed by manufacturers. We still have not yet achieved that goal. However, there's a project from a company called Raptor Engineering that uses IBM Power hardware. They produce high-end servers and workstations. IBM for Power 8 and Power 9 have made it possible for companies to provide free firmware and free software around their hardware. Another advantage as well, they provide a few other nice advantages as well. So for instance, I didn't cover microcode updates in the last slides. Microcodes is the software that, on most modern CPUs, the instruction set is not implemented purely by circuitry. It's implemented by software called microcode, which basically configures the logic gates inside the CPU to provide the various instructions that your software uses. The microcode is almost always non-free on any given system, whether it's Intel or anyone else. However, on Intel systems, the microcode is signed. The microcode that comes in, that comes with the CPU, you can use, but there are microcode updates that patch around bugs and security issues in the microcodes that the core boot projects will provide as binary blobs. We don't provide those in, in Leverboots. The problem with Intel is that those binary blobs that those microcode updates are signed. So even if you understood <coughs> how the microcode worked, even if you had the source code or were otherwise able to reverse engineer it, you would not be able to use your own modified microcode on Intel systems. On IBM Open Power hardware, this is not the case. The, <coughs> the microcode on, sorry, <coughs> sorry, my throat's a bit dry. So the microcode on 
open power systems is unsigned. You can, if you have the source code or you're otherwise able to reverse engineer it, you can actually run your own free microcode theoretically on open power platforms. So <coughs> if you're interested in a company that provides Libra hardware, not Libra boots, but still Libra boot firmware, just like Libra boots. If you want Libra boot firmware from the factory, look at a company called Raptor Engineering. They're based in the US. They have a project called the Talos 2, T-A-L-O-S, uh, Talos 2 and Talos 2 Lite. They that the Talos 2 is mostly high-end, it's for you know, servers and workstation purposes. The Talos 2 Lite is a slightly cheaper version. Although it's not Libra Boots, we do actually promote this on the Libra Boot website because it's free boot firmware, even though it's not Libra Boots directly. I'm going to go on to uh, the, n the next slide, which is about payloads. I, I don't really need to go into detail on this because I already alluded to, that to this in, in earlier slides. So basically, Corbett provides hardware initialization, jumps to a payload. Yeah, I've already talked about this, so I can skip over this one. So the Grub bootloader is the common, it's the most, it's the default payload in Libra Boots. So in Libra Boots, unlike on a uh, typical x86 BIOS, we, <coughs> we don't actually provide BIOS services in Libra Boots. So on a typical system, you boot into a BIOS, which has its own non-standard bootloader, which then loads a BIOS, typically, uh, sorry, which then loads a bootloader from the hard drive, typically GNU Grub, but it could be something else, provided by your operating system. On a LibreBoot system, that is not the case. You on, in, on Intel and AMD platforms, by default, we use the GNU Grub bootloader. So you, do, you have the hardware initialization in, in LibreBoot, and then once that's done, it jumps to Grub. Grub is embedded inside the flash chip where LibreBoot is. This has many benefits over a traditional BIOS. The first main benefit is you have faster boot speeds because you're booting directly into the bootloader, which actually starts your operating, si op operating system. Grub has support for, for reading from decrypted partitions. There's a command in Grub, crypto mounts, which you can use to actually decrypt a uh, Lux encrypted partition and read files from it. And this also means that you can encrypt your slash boot directory and boot an encrypted kernel from your hard drive. Grub has support for checking GPG signatures. So if you sign your Linux kernel, you can actually check the signature at boot time to check whether it's been tampered with. This is not really useful for most. Like if, you, if you're making your own signature on a Linux kernel on a binary provided by someone else, this is not directly useful because unless that binary is reproducible, if the Linux kernel is built reproducibly, then typically your distribution may provide GPG signatures. So if you were to use this feature, you'd probably use the signature provided by your distribution. Another benefit of Grub is that it can boot the Linux kernel directly from the flash chip. So I should explain briefly that Coreboot actually has its own file system inside the flash chip where Coreboot is installed. It's called CBFS, CB, uh, Coreboot File System. So when you flash core boot, there's a file system embedded into the ROM image. You can change whatever files are there. You can put a Linux kernel inside CBFS. So you can embed a Linux kernel into the flash chip and flash that along with LibreBoot and Grub. This could be useful for a number of purposes. Grub can also load other payloads. Grub, if you use the chain load command in Grub, when Grub is built as a Corbett payload. You can load other Corbett payloads if you compile them as ELF executables and embed those executables either into the flash chip or an external hard drive, USB flash drive, whatever it is, Grub can boot from that as well. So if you've got <coughs> another bootloader that you want to test out, if you've got, uh, you know, if you want to run CBIOS, you can load that from Grub. So that's useful. You one question wh as soon as I mentioned that Grub is embedded into the flash chip with Libra Boots, the most common thing that people typically ask is, "Oh, well, okay, then what if what if I reinstall my operating system? Do I need to reflash to get a new Grub configuration?" The answer is no. In Libra Boots, we automatically scan all of the partitions on whichever hard drives or storage devices are present 
we check for the presence of a uh, grub configuration file and switch to that if detected. You can change the grub configuration that's embedded into Lever Boots, but you don't have to, that's optional. So if anyone's wondering that, yeah, you can just, <coughs> for, from the user's perspective, you can install any GNU plus Linux distribution you want, <coughs> and typically speaking, Lever Boots will automatically detect and boot that, just as a standard BIOS would. The other payloads that we mainly use is the depth charge payloads. So I mentioned at the start of this talk that we support x86 and ARM. So for x86, we support various ThinkPads, we su uh, various uh, desktop motherboards from, I believe, Asus and Intel. There's also one gigabyte motherboard we support. We also support one server motherboards, the SSK GP316. That's x86. There are several uh, Chromebooks that we support. Coreboot has very good support for Chromebooks in general. Now, with Chromebooks, you can get one of two architectures. If you buy a Chromebook, it will either have an uh, Intel x86 processor or it will have an ARM platform embedded into it. So there's a chipset based on ARM called the Rockchip uh, RK3288. There are several Chromebooks supported in Core Boot that can be used entirely with free software. We support all of the, those Chromebooks at present in LibreBoot. If you download LibreBoot from, from the latest Git repository, you'll find support for several ARM-based Chromebooks. But on ARM, we don't use GNU Grub or CBIOS. We use another payload called Depth Charge. Depth Charge is a bootloader, very similar to Grub. It's maintained by Google, and it provides many of the same advantages. So, for instance, it can check, it can check si signatures on your Linux kernel at boot time, things like that. <coughs> so I'll go on to some s the next slides which talk about operating system support. GNU plus Linux is fully supported in Libreboot. You can use almost pr basically any distribution you can think of should work. There's more information about this on libreboot.org slash docs slash GNU Linux. You can find information there on the website for how to install it. BSD is also supported. NetBSD works out of the box. OpenBSD works. Last time we tested it, FreeBSD wasn't fully compatible, but most of the BSD distributions should work in LibreBoot as well. That has been tested. Other operating systems, like I've got listed here on the slide, React OS, FreeDOS, Psycho OS, Calibri OS. Most other operating systems are unsupported in LibreBoot, usually because they rely on BIOS services that LibreBoot doesn't provide. So basically, mainly we only support GNU Plus Linux and BSD. Windows is completely unsupported in LibreBoot at present. So yeah, the next slide says what's new since last release. So I said uh, earlier on in the talk that my priority for this talk was to go through the slides briefly and then at the end of the talk, go through a list of changes that have been made to the project in the last two years. That's what I'm going to do now. So. Okay, uh, so in the last two years, so the last stable release of LibreBoots was about two years ago. A lot of people sometimes ask the question, is LibreBoots still being developed? And the answer is yes. LibreBoots has been extremely active over the last few years. However, since mid-2016, we've been working on a new build system. Basically, LibreBoots has been completely rewritten in the last year or two. So we currently don't have a new stable release, and I don't ha currently have an ETA for when the next stable release is. But you can look in the Git repository for LibreBoot and look at all of the changes that we've made in the last two years. I, ha I actually have a change log of all of the, it, I was gonna show it on the screen, but obviously the screen doesn't work. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to skim through a change log that has been made to say what we've been working on in the last year or two. After this, I'm basically going to ask the audience if they want to ask questions. So generally speaking, I'm looking at, at the list now. Generally speaking, we we have bug fixes from AppStream for various systems already supported in LibreBoot. Uh, just having a look to see for major changes. I don't really need to go into detail on most of these changes. Can I look? Just going through the list. I will ask the audience if they want to ask questions in momentarily. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through some 
some of the major changes that we've done in the last few years. So as I alluded to earlier on in the talk, in initially Leverbooks had a very kind of authoritarian leadership structure. It was basically me calling all the shots. Now Leverbooks is developed by a committee. You can look on Leverbook.org slash management.html and that will have the information there about the leadership structure of the project. The project is now democratically run by a committee. I'm on that committee as are three other people at present. That's one of the major changes that we've done to the projects in the last few years. Uh, what else have we done? In terms of technical changes, that this list that, that I have on my screen here is actually quite extensive. I don't think it would be fruitful for me to discuss those in this talk because I don't think I really have time. I could talk. I could go into one or two of them, but then if I go do one of them, I have to do the rest. So I'm just going to see if there are some things relevant that I could talk about. Okay, so I'll give a, a general overview. So generally speaking, we want the 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 Libre Boot build system has been completely written in, re rewritten in the last two years. One of the, the overarching goals that we have for the next Libreboot release is for it to be more configurable. So one of the problems with the current stable release is that a lot of things are very much hard-coded. You know, it, it builds one configuration for each system and there's not really much chance for the user to configure anything in Libreboot. So we hard-code a lot of stuff. We also, we also patch core boot for that purpose in the current stable release. So generally speaking, we want Libreboot to be more customizable for the next release. We have several new Chromebooks that have been added to Libreboot, so we support more hardware in the current Git repository in Libreboot. I'm, I'm sorry, Leo. Um, we're over time We're here. over time? Yeah. Already? Yeah, these aren't hour-long sessions. Um, oh, well. Can we maybe point the audience to where they can find these yeah, things so online uh, there? Appar apparently, I, I've H how long have I been talking for? Only about 40 minutes, I think. Yeah. I thought I had long. Okay, so I actually thought I had longer. I was going to ask the audience if they wanted to ask questions, but obviously that's not possible. So if you, if anyone wants to meet up with me and you know crowd around me outside, that's fine. If you want to talk to me outside and ask me anything you want, I'll just r quickly wrap up then. In that case, uh, future plans. I'm just going to literally blast through. This will only take a minute or two. So the future plans for the next release: polish the current build system, make it all work properly, you know, make everything stable. Bring all current hardware support, hardware that's supported in Libreboot, up to date on the latest revisions of Coreboot. Test everything thoroughly. Uh, I already mentioned configurability. New infrastructure. So we're currently looking in. We've been meaning to set up a mailing list for some time now, but we still don't have one. I, I'm looking into doing that at some point. We're also looking into setting up build bots for automated build testing. We currently don't have that. Generally speaking, we want to make the Libreboot projects easier for people to develop for people to get involved. So there are two important pieces of infra infrastructure that we want to implement. Currently, we use a website called notabug.org, which uses GOGS, a uh, free Git-based uh, collaboration system. We want to install GitLab CE, which is the free software edition of GitLab, I should say. We want to host that on, on libreboot.org directly on our own server. It provides many advanced features, so we want to make Libreboot easier to get for people to get involved with. I'll just briefly say how you can help the Libreboot project. Again, we, we've run out of time. We want Libreboot. Okay, hang on. Okay, so you c if you have technical skills, basically, you know, go on the RC channel, add for core boots, add new hardware support, and so on. You can help us with the build system. We're currently looking for volunteers on that. You can tell your friends about Libreboot, help people install it, and so on. Organize workshops at your local, you know, hackerspace, user group, whatever it is. You can help, if you spot anything wrong with the documentation, you can submit patches to that. Go on libreboot.org forward slash gets.html and that has information about, about how you can contribute. Contact methods, we're on hash libreboot on Freenode. So Freenode RC hash libreboot. We have uh, Reddit, subreddits, uh, slash r slash libreboot. The list of current developers is on libreboot.org slash management.html. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you.